Justin Marshall joins us. He is back on terra firma. Marshy, you've had a couple of days and a good long plane ride to sulk about those last 10 minutes at Twickenham. How are you feeling about it now, mate? Oh, yeah, look, I think, uh, to be perfectly honest, Marty, it was just basically a catalyst of how the year played out, really, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Look, to be fair, I, I thought the All Blacks actually played uh, predominantly pretty well for the majority of that game. Um, they, they looked like they had found a little bit of rhythm. But unfortunately, again, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with the fact that you haven't got a team that's consistently been picked, uh, who, when they should be winning games, they somehow let things slide. Um, when you rely on a bench sometimes to make an impact, which I felt they did in Scotland, they didn't do the same, they didn't do the same thing against England. It still just doesn't sort of sit quite right. There's something still not quite gelling, and I think it's been exactly how the year played out. Look, I, was, I said it on Monday. I said it afterwards, mate. I said that, and some. I mean, once I got kind of over the yelling and the screaming, but I just thought, you know, that it was actually a, a good way to finish because it reminded us that not all is well exactly as you're saying. And the mix said on Monday as well. He echoed the same thing: the the, conti- the continuity with selection that's not there couple of things to this, mate. Clearing the bench, I, mean, look, I, I know it's the way that rugby does these days, but why wouldn't you keep Aaron Smith on? Why do you take that experience off? What, you know, don't, do the players want to be on the field at 80 minutes and go, yes, we've just dicked you for 80 minutes? Isn't that as a player what you want? Oh, of course it is, absolutely. And, and you know, unless you're absolutely spent uh, and, and you haven't got any capacity to carry on uh, and the game is in the balance, um, but many would argue that the game wasn't, and, and maybe the All Blacks got complacent and they thought that they had it in the bag. I'm not sure, but it wasn't an experienced bench. So it was it was a bench that was good enough to go out and play enough test rugby to make sure that the game that was under control stayed under control. Um, the, wor- the worrying thing for me, I, I, the conversation I had with you, mate, was you, you, you saw, we, we, we talked about how this year had played out. We talked about this tour and, and what we think about the selections I've made and you know, maybe they should have used it as a quarterfinal, semi-final, final for the Rugby World Cup and thrown that same team out there and one or three and we'd feel a lot better. And you sort of said to me, as a spell, it would test for the, is England is it England the one, you know, must win. And, and ultimately, the All Blacks didn't win it. So, so where does that leave us? Where does that leave this side? And the fact that, OK, it's England, it's like in 2019, a bit of payback, a bit of revenge, uh, stick it to them and... and, and right the wrongs from 2019 and go into next year with limited test matches uh, and feel confident. And ultimately, you know, they, they, they basically pulled their pants down in the last 10 minutes and all we got out of it was a draw. So how can you gauge that as being a pass mark? Yeah, look, I mean, I sat, remember, I don't know if you can remember, look, I, I, I sat after the, the Eden Park test against Australia and gave us a B-. minus. I haven't changed from that. Yeah, there, there's so many... Question still isn't there, but in some ways, going into a World Cup, yeah, is that is that going to be beneficial to us? Because as I say, we we aren't the finished article yet, and maybe we I don't know I don't think there's complacency in that All Black side, but certainly as a fan, if we'd beaten England, I would have thought shit, everything's actually on the right track now, yeah. and it's not. No, it's not, and, and look, there's no doubt about the fact that we're, we're missing some some players that, that could probably you know help the All Blacks uh, next year um, that will come back into the mix, you know, and and, and, and the loose forwards. Um, you know, maybe Cullen Grace gets a look in, but and, and Ethan Blackadder, um, you know, Will Jordan, I was obviously massively missed, but you know, ultimately every team is missing the odd yeah, player. Yeah, so yeah. But they still function and their squad still functions. So we, we can't use that as, oh, well, we'll be better because everyone else will be better and everybody else will get firepower back. Um, look, I, I, when you asked me that question and you gave B minus, I gave C, I would not change um, from that C. Uh, I felt that this end of year tour was really important for the All Blacks to make a statement to, to the rest of the rugby world that they were actually out of their rut and they were ready to press forward and, and have a, a launch a real assault in this rugby world cup. I don't think anyone's shaking in their boots. But let's be honest. But is, do you think Ireland and France at the moment are going, oh my God, the All Blacks, they came over here, they annihilated Wales, they annihilated Scotland, they annihilated England, and they look like they're on fire. We better watch out for them come World Cup next year. Absolutely not. I know, no, I'm just no. speaking honestly. I wish it was different. Same. Because I'm, I'm a proud All Black and I want us to be the best in the world and I want us to play the best rugby in the world. And I want, when every time I see that team go out there to challenge the opposition with ball in hand, 
and cut them open from any part of the field. And I'm just not seeing it at the moment, and that's what's pissing me off. It's not the fact that the results uh, are hurting us, which they are. It's also the way we're playing, the manner we're playing. And again, you know, I just don't feel we're helping ourselves with things like selection, with things like certain game plans against certain teams. Um, I, like I said, I don't, I don't think the rest of the world are in fear. In fact, all we're doing is giving them a little bit of a sniff of, you know what, they're not that invincible anymore. Maybe that's good as well. I'm, I'm looking at glass half full. Maybe that's yep. good as well, mate, because I'm just thinking yep. that, you know, <clears throat> I hope that they underestimate us because we'll bite their ass if that's the mm-hmm. case. But I also think that this is a, a World Cup where, I mean, the All Blacks are always dangerous and no team can take us lightly, but whether we can win back to back to back, whether we can win those three on the bounce, I just, I just, I have no confidence in that whatsoever because you also know, Justin, the history of World Cups is no team plays well in the knockouts three matches in a row. You normally have to win one of them pretty ugly. And all of these other teams, mm-hmm. I think, you know, have the confidence now to go, hey, not only can we get out there and compete, we can actually beat the All Blacks. That's my biggest worry, that they're starting to believe they can beat us, all of them. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's eliminated that fear factor of teams that when they get in a position to be able to, to beat the All Blacks, usually they're the ones that crumble. And, and to a degree, Scotland were a bit like that. They played pretty well all day when it came to that, until that last quarter. They, they just... I don't think they had the courage to, to take that game by the scruff of the neck. Um, you know, they had massive history on their shoulders to try and do that. You know, most of the other teams that the All Blacks will meet don't have that enigma against them, you know, apart from Wales maybe who have got that 70-year uh, hiatus against them. But in general, the other teams have recently beaten the All Blacks um, in, in the last couple of years. So that, that, that's not, no longer a factor. So then it's all about, you know, uh, performance on the day. Um, and, and getting the job done. And at, at this point in time, not all the time are the All Blacks uh, getting the job done. But I totally agree with you. There's an opportunity there for the All Blacks to ambush this Rugby World Cup. Yes. If they've got the yeah. courage mm. to play and to be the side that we know that they can be, that, that's the key. Like, for me, that opening game of the World Cup, they can sneak in there as underdogs against the home nation who will have a full crowd uh, of support behind them with but with massive pressure on them. The All Blacks will be underdog because of uh, the, the fact that, you know, the French are number one in the world, undefeated, and it, it's a perfect opportunity to go in there, sneak that game, fall onto the right side of the draw, and all of a sudden find yourself in a World Cup final. Do we have faith that they can do that? I just hate, as soon as you say the word underdog, I just hate it, mate. I'm an old man, I'm an old school. I like the All Blacks. We go out there with our, with our thing out, mate. I mean, we're the All Blacks. So you want to come yeah. and get some. That's how, I mean, I, that's, how I, that's how I love our team. I've always yeah. loved our team. I don't want to be underdogs. I mean, maybe if we play Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit and God, I mean, they've got a great front row straight away, haven't they? But the rest of the world, mate, no. No. No, no, that's right. But look, if you, if you were thinking about it at the moment, if the All Blacks were to head over and uh, have a game in Paris against France, they would be underdogs. Yeah. If they were to go to Dublin and play Ireland, they would go in as, as uh, underdogs. And uh, that, that's simple math. You know, the, the performances, recent results point that direction. Yeah, I'm know. totally with you. We're always pumped, we always puff our chest out. We always flex the bicep and say, come and get us. You know, give it the best you've got. But at the moment, our results against both of those nations haven't been conducive to being able to puff our chest out and flex our muscles. No. So that's just reality. Um, the All Blacks, as long as they still believe, will think differently. Um, but it's about them, you know, galvanising and being that team that we know that they can be. Because at the moment, they're a shadow of the side that I feel that they can they, they, they can be with the talent they've got. The other thing, Justin Marshall's with us, 81 Test veteran for the All Blacks, you know that people, is, is after watching the Women's World Cup as well, and look, I know they're two completely different games, but... Jeez, I tell you what, the refereeing of that game at Twickenham, Justin. I mean, if this is what we're going to see for a World Cup, this is meant to be the shop window of the game for the world. I really worry. You know, I, was, I, was, I started the show by saying, look, if you flew in from outer space and you, and you went around to your best mate's place how, and, and he said, look, sit down and watch this test match at uh, Twickers with the All Blacks, two fantastic teams, you wouldn't last the 80 minutes, mate. You know, 28 bloody penalties, every single infraction in the rule book. It's just such a frustrating game to watch at times. Yeah, and, and typically Rugby World Cups is where it's at its worst. Yeah, you know, I think about Japan, and I think the pool matches are an absolute disgrace. The amount of red and yellow cards, and um, you know the, the the directive that the referees had going into that World Cup, it was spoiling games. The players weren't adjusting. It was an absolute mess. And you know, if going into the the next Rugby World Cup under those uh, same I, I guess requirements, then it makes it really difficult because the players all of a sudden are being 
officiated, uh, you know, basically too strongly, and and and, and that can, can produce the negativity. Uh, it can produce a reluctance to play because you get into the fear of making mistakes that ultimately keep you out of quali- uh, qualifying through your pool, and then obviously knock out comp- competition. So, so they're, they're hugely important to to the flow of the game. And at the moment, I don't feel that. We've got it all quite right, not not just between the laws of the game and the way they're being officiated, but also some of the, uh, the, the I guess, the yellow and red card stuff that the TMOs get involved with. But the biggest problem is world rugby also, the directive, the directive they're giving the referees. And if the referees don't penalise certain things that usually they could let go, and then they go into their review, they get told, well, that, sh- that was a penalty. Why didn't you penalise yeah, it? Yeah. Like, well, I'd already dished out five penalties by then, you know, 10 minutes in the game. Yeah, but that's still a penalty. So... There's a real sort of common denominator here, which is that the, the, the referees in the world rugby and then the players and the coaches are all thinking the same thing, but the directive that's coming from world rugby is that you've got to police it, and if you don't, it, well, we'll put you on the sub, put you on the sub bench. And, but that's not ideal for them, I don't think. No, it's a, it's look, it's not a way to referee thinking that you know Big Brother's looking over no. your shoulder, marking the exam before you've actually finished it. What about you know? Did the game flow? You know, I mean, did you pick up most of the stuff? Did you actually just allow, yeah. you know, it's like it's like in a game of football with the World Cup going on at the moment. You can ping absolutely everything, Justin, but there are times you've got to let yeah. play on, wave play on. Another thing I wanted to ask you about was we had Wayne Smith on um, on Tuesday, just a wonderful interview with him again. And one of the, he, he, came, he comes up with these statements and he said to me, Marty, he said, I hate box kicks. He said, I won't coach a box kick. He said, I coach my players, their women at the World Cup, he said, to go for the crossfield kicks like rugby league or kick where the seagulls are in the space. He said, a box kick is a grenade that you're hoping something good happens. How about that for a quote? And I can understand his, his method in that because what, what you're ultimately doing is you're, you're telling the opposition, if you watch the scrum halves nowadays, it's so premeditated because they're literally raking the ball back with their foot and it's taking so long and everybody's about to say, can see it. It's like, he's going to box kick. Yeah, yeah. So the opposition know he's going to box kick. The winger and the fullback get themselves set. Players get ready to charge it down so they make kick, the kick pressurised. Yeah, but I can understand where he's coming from because it's literally telling the opposition exactly what you're going to do. And because of that, you're not dictating the terms of play when you've got the ball in hand. When you're in attack, you should be making the opposition guess about what you're going to do. Where are you going to kick? Are you going to run? Are you going to pass? You know, and, and at the moment, because it's so elongated and they want so much protection, the scrum half, so they don't get charged down, it's, it's just giving the opposition uh, the opportunity to defuse any att- attempt to win the ball back. So, yeah, you know, Smithy, Smithy's never had not a great brain for the game. No, so, that's it, yeah. uh, I'm not surprised you e- didn't say that. Even now, you know, the other thing, sorry, just harking back to that all-black thing, Justin, shutting the game down at that point, you've been in these positions, you've eaten, you've said to me many times and told the listeners many times, you've gone back to the dressing room afterwards, sat there and thought, hell, how did we win that game? But we did win it. When you're in that position, what do you mean to do? Because, I mean, TJ had a brain fade. Apparently, Artie said to him, kick the, you know, do a box kick. I don't know why he did it, but wh- what are we meant to do then? You, are you meant to hold, recycle, hold, recycle? Walk us through those last few minutes if you're behind that forward pack. Well, you've you got to think about what the opposition are doing. And England certainly changed because they got desperate. So all of a sudden, you've got to recognise, OK, what we were doing uh, for the, the, the 70 minutes prior to, to, to now, the opposition were doing this in response. Now, obviously, they're in a different mindset now where they're literally chasing the game. So the pitch that they're giving us is completely different. So how do we then enable ourselves to continually put them under pressure, basically make them run up their own ass? So you, you say, OK, well, you, you're a territory-based you were very, I guess, methodical in your attack, one-dimensional, but now you're throwing variations in because you're chasing the game. So if we throw line speed at you, so that's about the leaders getting together and going, okay, they've slightly changed their game plan. We can actually put them under more pressure because we know that they're going to be desperate. They're trying to find space that's not there. Let's not show them the space. It's all about making sure that you recognise that they've changed their method. They're the ones chasing the game, not you. The other one's chasing the points on the scoreboard. So as long as you continue to force them into making miracle plays, yep. um, if they manage to pull that off... Well, yeah, well, they, fair well yeah, fair, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, fair play to them, yeah. Final then uh, question being Razor. Now, you know uh, Scott a lot better than the rest of us do. And look, I know he's a crafty old bugger too. And I'm thinking that he's playing a little bit of game here, that he's looking at NZR and going, you're going to give me that job that Fozzie's got at the end of the World Cup. 
But guess what? If you don't, I'm on the other side. I'm sure he wants to coach us before England, doesn't he? Oh, absolutely he does. It's his dream to coach the All Blacks. As, as any coach, as any former player, as any rugby player, no matter where you've come from or any aspiring coach has ever been played the game, you want to coach the All Blacks if you're a New Zealander with, with, with those ambitions. That's the ultimate in the game. I, I think for Razor at the moment, probably the biggest thing for him is trust. Um, no doubt about it. Like I think in, in the last half of the year, I've found out you know, um, that, that employers can tell you one thing and, and all of a sudden, you know, at the, at the 11th hour, um, they change their mind. And that really throws you. And all of a sudden, promises that are made are broken and, and it makes you feel very vulnerable. It makes you feel like the fact that, you know, when, you, when you're told something's going to happen, it doesn't happen. You're all of a sudden in no man's land. And I certainly feel the things the New Zealand Rugby Union have told Scott are not things that have happened. Um, we know that from August um, when they had their big review. Um, he got told certain things and they didn't happen. So how can you rely then on them come the end of next year when they say, we promise you, we'll give you the job, the All Blacks go over, win the Rugby World Cup, everything's amazing again, that you're still going to be able to, to have and fulfil that when they've shown historically that they have got the ability to change their mind at the 11th hour, which is, you know, has, has happened to me recently. And it really throws you. So what my point is, is if I'm him, bird in the hand, Marty. Bird in the hand. Right, this I see. Is, yeah. This is one of the superpower teams that is, uh, is, say, if it is saying to you, you will coach, we will sign the contract now. Um, can he have the faith that the one that's let him down previously will keep by their word? You know, or if you want to coach internationally, do you grab that window and grab it now? Because who knows what can happen in a calendar year, Good given point. what has already happened to him and the promises that were made that weren't kept. Oh, you're brilliant, Marshall. I love talking to you, mate. I hope you got off the plane and got a huge list, mate. Right, you've been away for three weeks with your mates drinking beer, and here's the list. I hope uh, you got a hammer. Uh, I'll tell you what, no problem, Marty. And I, I got offered a beer by one of my mates, and I had to turn it down. and said, I don't want to see any more of that stuff for a week. I need to drop out. <laughs> <laughs> Great talking to you as always, dude. Absolutely love the time that you give us, Justin. Justin Marshall, 81 Test veteran for the All Blacks. And, of course, you know, Sky Sport. He's one of the best, I believe, analysts of the game of all.